them squiggle lines that you see. Okay. Hello, welcome to the letter sewed version of Deconversion Therapy. I'm Karen. I'm Bonnie. And Karen told me that I sniff a lot. She has to edit it out. So, um, listen for that, y'all. I'm medically diagnosing <laughs> you. That's I'm what thrilled. Our new podcast. <laughs> we have a bunch of new podcasts. We've started, you just did it. We started <laughs> our own network called Carnally. And we're going to have a medical diagnosis one, a what to watch on TV one, and Wait. then. A visual one, pure visual <laughs> podcast. It just occurred to me, and you probably edited it out from some other previous podcast, but I gave some kind of weird ass plug for the things that you stick on your nose to make your the breathe, breathe right. You have the breathe right strips. I think that I probably have a deviated septum. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe your diagnosis did more than you realize. Um, my diagnoses are right on, and I feel <laughs> you've got a bit of the diabetes in your nose. Stop it! Just your nose? That's awful! Why? I don't know. I'm afraid of diabetes. I just made it up. All right. Oh, so you know what? I think no. I think I probably did too much cocaine. Mm -hmm. cocaine um <laughs> so, but like maybe maybe somebody could tell me that i have a deviated septum and then i could get the nose job i always wanted i do have a deviated septum i Whatever. can get a nose job but you know what i seriously now here's another podcast serious talk with karen <laughs> lee um i'm horrified of not being able to breathe out my nose for a week while it's repairing. I'm, wow. Because, as you know... Oh, I didn't say I why. Have, I said wow. <laughs> I have a weird choking mechanism. So I'm like, oh. what if I do that choking on nothing thing and I can't breathe out my nose? I will panic. So I'm like really afraid right. of that. They'd probably give you some good Xanax, though, to alleviate for your fears. For the week? For the week. Yeah. All right. I don't know. And then the other thing is, I have a large nose, and I have a feeling <laughs> that when the aliens land on Earth, they're going to be looking for people <laughs> with perfect noses, and then... Oh. They're gonna they're gonna blast those people into oblivion, and they're gonna save oh. the ones that have historic noses oh. because they can use our DNA for something. Done. Okay. Well, they're they're gonna gloss right by me. My nose looks like like this. It's the same width from top to bottom. It's like a finger. Yours no, is a it's good like nose. a Vienna sausage. Okay. And just in case. And if you want to see that Vienna sausage, come for our <laughs> Zoom meetings. <laughs> There's our plug for sponsorship, deconversiontherapypodcast.com. Yeah. So briefly, I know you just said you watched Inventing Anna. Oh, I loved it. I watched, oh, what was it called? Oh, Very Bad Vegan, I think. And... That, and then there's another show, I think it was called The Puppet Master, that's so weird, and it parallels Christianity in a way, because it's the idea that you can be with someone, friend, whatever, romantic okay. partner, and it almost be a cult because they brainwash you into believing and doing things that yeah. later you cannot justify yeah. At all. It's so weird. What's it called? The Puppet Master? That one was crazy. Crazy. Okay. And this last one is called Very Bad Vegan about a place you always probably ate when you were in New York, a raw food restaurant called Pure Food and Wine or something like that. Anyway, the lady who ran it started dating a guy because 
Alec Baldwin wanted to date her. Okay. And she became friends with him. He would always show up and tweet about her. But he also, like, tweeted this other guy that just lived in Massachusetts somewhere. And then that guy began flirting with her. And then they decided to start something, and everything went awry. Um, Interesting. But the whole Alec Baldwin connection's interesting because she's like, maybe I should have just, you know, I regret that I didn't take things forward with Alec. And uh, the why? Because he he and his current wife are having like five kids now. Like yeah. who wants that many babies? <laughs> I was thinking more <laughs> about the shooting, but yeah. Oh, and, okay. Well. But this was, I think, recorded before the shooting. But the other thing is that he met Hilaria at that restaurant. So oh, right, she, right. she was very enmeshed with it. Anywho, it's weird. The whole thing about people you are close to and stay with, and it could be your youth group, pastor, etc. You start believing and doing weird things. Yeah. So inventing Anna you liked... I loved it, and I didn't know one single thing about the real story. So I liked watching it, knowing that it was real, and then I had to keep my hands off Google, <laughs> just like right, right. And um, and then I've went, uh, I've went, and then I've gone back and looked at some of the interviews with this real woman. Oh, and she's crazy. Sure, but everybody said she was charming. And nice. Right. I don't get it. I know, but this is what I think they, I think that that's one of the characteristics of what people always attribute to narcissist type Mm -hmm. personalities. And, um, I have some of that in my life (laughs) and, (laughs) and I, I always go again, (laughs) Karen So I always go, what are these people thinking? She's not charming. And, um, I think that my, I think you and I probably have more sensitive bullshitometers than some people. And I also think that when people talk about niceness, they're overlaying the money aspect and they're like, that person is nice for a very rich heiress. You know, like their their idea of nice is still got that money thing connected to it because I think if she was just like this everyday person which she was no spoiler people would be like ew that is very um weird but and I think I think too anytime people pay for stuff for you you're probably a little bit like one one payment of a meal at a time like oh that was nice oh exactly I don't know. That person's generous. I mean, yeah. hey, 30 years of marriage right here, so I get it. Um, <laughs> yeah, congratulations <all> right. <laughs> on that. <laughs> Thank you. So I did a live on TikTok. I should do one uh, on our Instagram, so watch for those. Or in our Facebook group, Deconversion Therapy has to be let in. Did you know we have over 1,000 members now? We have oh, like 80 so cool. people who want to get in, but they don't answer the questions. Um, and don't invite your loser friends. No, they have to go through and, and answer the questions. Your but loser friends. We just want winners. We only. They must be heiresses. <laughs> but uh, people asked on the TikTok live, like the whole thing about my husband and I meeting is on fire for Christ missionaries and then Mm -hmm. lasting through deconstruction and how that worked and it is quite the tale so one day i'll get into it i don't know how i don't know when we'll see anywho um so our letter said today bonnie yeah i would love to hear you're such a better reader than i am like seriously so read all of them (laughs) Thanks. That's really nice. Okay, so I snuck ahead to the end of this, and it said they don't want their name used. So thanks, Arnold. Um, hey, bam, y'all. Bam. We Okay, so hey, y'all. Just listen to your, your letter episode, and a story came to mind. 
I grew up in the Bible Belt of South Texas. Oh, that is the Bible Belt. Um, as what I would describe as a culty evangelical Christian, but my family would describe as non-denominational Christian. <laughs> right. We, you explained to me what that meant before. Yeah, so it's this way of... I always thought it was this way of saying... All denominations are welcome because doesn't it almost sound unifying, but it's not. It is specifically most of the time a bit charismatic. Nice. So tricky. Tongues I don't like that. can be allowed, but it, oh my God. It, and it can go way into the chandelier swinging, but it can also <laughs> be calmer. Yeah. Oh, well, see, okay. Growing up, we bounced from problematic church after church <laughs> until one day my father, whilst church shopping one Sunday morning, landed on the mother load. A brand new church smack dab in a row of mega churches off a major freeway in San Antonio. The church was started by a couple from South Africa, the pastor extremely robotic, while his wife met up where he lacked <laughs> in personality. Um, I won't get into the hour-long pre-sermons ew, on tithes and offerings or the forcing of teenage girls getting upstage to pretend that they were physically giving, ew, birth to the Holy Spirit <laughs> this time. I told you. <laughs> because this particular story came to mind. Well, okay, what is giving birth to the Holy Spirit? There are Ew, is it going to come out of your hoo-ha? <laughs> <laughs> See, that's it. Can they really prove that it didn't come out of their butt? No. <sighs> so, but... This obviously is more to the extreme of things, but that's what I was talking about. Like inventing Anna and the ones that I watched that I can't remember uh -huh. already. Yeah. Like, you are gaslit slowly into thinking this is normal and good. Right. I yeah. don't know. Well, that's why they try to isolate you. Like right. it's happened to me. <laughs> and then Stockholm Syndrome. Anyway. Okay. So... Back to Arnold's letter. I attended said church from ages 8 to 17. It's a long time. So I saw it go through dozens of characters, especially when it came to the youth ministry. Eventually, the church landed on a couple who, in the beginning, didn't seem more excited or extreme than the pastor of the church. That all changed after about a year when youth group slowly started to evolve from pointless wacky games and scare tactics to holy revivals. This included, quote, blood cloth ceremonies. What the hell is that? Calling down angel feathers oh, and yeah. gold dust gold from dust. the heavens yep. and even begging God in unison to kill us if we wouldn't live on to further his glory. This sounds mild. It's just, <laughs> what uh, is, do you know a what Sunday a blood morning. cloth ceremony is? I am uh, really worried about that. I will look <laughs> it up. I do know the feathers and the gold dust, and there's also gems. And I know people who have inv been involved in these things where, like, you worship and you pray, and then you look down, and there's a stone of some sort, and it oh. proves whatever. Um, of course, no one, like, takes him to a jeweler who says... Wow, this is Tanzanite. Here's a lot of money for so, this, <laughs> and put it back so in your church. Do they just no. like so? Do they have them in their pocket and like throw them on stage? That it'll be like on the pews and the chairs. It's usually chairs because these places are usually located in plazas, but um. or school assembly rooms. Mm -hmm. But yeah, I mean, they never proved that. This stuff was real, but it was supposed to be like God blessing you. And I'm like, can't he bless people with health or like what? What the hell yeah. do you need with a piece of, you know, pink glass? Anyway. Well, any guess what? We're going to find what? out soon because I snuck a little sneak uh, to see what the next sentence in this letter was. But one Sunday night, we had a blood cloth ceremony. I had I'm seen it done at... once before and felt very disturbed by it. But in case you're not aware, because God, who should be? 
It's a ritual like practice where two people hold a cheap poly nylon red fabric scrap across the stage while the congregation walks beneath it one by one and falls under the impression of the Holy Ghost. Okay. Okay. So that night during the chaos, that was the best improv acting I've personally ever seen in that size of a group. I decided to sit in the back and hopefully be unnoticed. (laughs) This was obviously not an option. The pastor's wife, who was not a fan of me, I wore too much makeup and caused my brethren to struggle, (laughs) pulled me up to the line and a small panic started to ensue. I had walked under the cloth before and unlike my fellow youth group kids chose not to throw myself on the floor (laughs) and sob directly after and instead calmly sit back in my chair. And that was just huge issue. So I knew this time it was going to require some acting. It got closer and closer to my turn. And in that time, I scanned the front row to see who exactly my audience would be. (laughs) There was said pastor's wife a few of the younger youth pastors and a guy in the youth group who was a massive perv who (laughs) constantly tried to elicit nudes from my 15 year old self to no avail. This made me feel so much better. (laughs) Oh my God. Nudes. It's just such a funny word. It is. Um, Especially with two O's. (laughs) In that moment, I knew what I had to do. I had to go all out. (laughs) In a way, sure, it was a punishment to the unfairness and forceful hand of the youth pastors, but it was also an opportunity to ensure that said perv boy would never contact me again. Two birds, baby. (laughs) So I walk up to the blood cloth while dramatic music blasts about the Lord's mercy and groups of teens were sobbing on the ground in front of me. I walk under the cloth and go full on exorcist. I threw myself on the ground and did my best impression of a seizure for what felt like an hour, but in reality it was more like five minutes. God, five minutes of faking a seizure is pretty it's long. Very physically yeah. taxing. <laughs> All the while fighting the urge to laugh and break character. The pastor's wife above me praying and pretending to pull the demon from my belly, <laughs> extremely theatrically. <laughs> She went full out screaming the whole Hamshama Dawap, a.k.a. tongues, which was supposed to help. And after a while, I realized the entire church was watching this scene play out. I started to break under the pressure until I looked up and saw the perv staring directly at me in pure disgust and fear. This gave me the fuel to go on spitting and flailing for another (laughs) five to ten minutes. All the while, the pastor's wife was making a massive scene about how I had attracted this lustful spirit inside the bowels of my temple. Oh. Sexy bowels. Bowels. (laughs) I finally got bored and simply stood up, wiped my face off, and sat back down, to which the entire congregation watched in full confusion, unsure of how to react. Should they applaud? Did she actually extract some demon? Either way, the look of fury on her face when I stood up, mixed with the I'm never going to be able to get hard again look on the perv's (laughs) face, was pure bliss for me. I thought for sure that after I was going to hell, but let's be real, worth it. Um, Thank you so much. (laughs) Thank you. Holy shit. (laughs) Can, Can you? That is just when we talk about religious trauma, add in that physical work right there. Like that would be there every Sunday. That's wow. so, oh my gosh. To try to explain to like random coworkers too. <laughs> right, right. Like you can't share that stuff with other people. No. That's oh why God. then there's that isolation. That's why, that's yeah. why we're here. Oh my we sh- are here for you. You oh nut jobs. I know. <laughs> you need therapy so badly. Oh, my, my God. gosh. It makes what we went through sound like, you know, not Exactly. A lot. Exactly. Cheesecake is what I like to say. Cheesecake. And, I mean, I've had some demons tried to cast out of me, but, oh, and right. it was dramatic, but there was no shaking, flailing, foaming at the mouth thing. And, uh, no, no. Yeah. Oh, my God. My demons were relatively calm, but at the same time, so, seeing that you haven't had them cast out of you, supposedly you have to 
call them in the name of Jesus, and you usually have to shout very forcefully, like your, quote, confidence doing it is what makes them listen, and you have to keep saying in Jesus' name and all that. And then, again, you go back and just think, wow, why is the devil so fucking powerful? (laughs) We would, you know, in our minds, we're like, oh, look how powerful Jesus is. Well, then, why can't you just whisper and say, be gone, demon? Anyway, I guess the bowels being involved make it (laughs) dramatic. It's, It's such a struggle. Okay, this one's from Aiden. Dear Bonnie and Karen, comma, I mean, that is, that's some good writing. Uh, I love your podcast so much. Well, that's dumb. No. I love your (laughs) podcast so much. It gives me, quote, good tidings of great joy every time I listen to an episode. I think I've been listening for around a year and a half now and have decided to revisit your early episodes while I impatiently wait for new ones. Uh (laughs) Uh-oh. I told Bonnie, because Bonnie works so much, I'm like, people want them every day. And Bonnie's like, (laughs) Karen, you are hot. No, damn it. Karen, (laughs) you were talking about your missionary days and told a story of a little skit that you and your missionary pals did For the people of whatever country you were in that reminded me of a little skit that my youth group used to do. Yes. (laughs) We actually did this skit several years in a row as a talent competition sponsored by the Wesleyan Church, the denomination I grew up in, called Teens in, just a capital N, Talent. What? Teens in Talent. So like an apostrophe. No, there was no, it's just a capital N, Bonnie. No (laughs) apostrophe. Picture this. An innocent, devout girl stands alone on the stage, pantomiming, reading the Bible or praying when the ominous piano notes of the opening of Total Eclipse of the Heart (laughs) begins playing. As the song continues, another young person walks on the stage with a cigarette and a poster board (laughs) sign around their neck with a string that says, Cigarettes. (laughs) (laughs) Like for sale. Just, no, it's just cigarettes. They offer her the cigarette that she kindly refuses until she can't just take the pressure anymore, and she tries the cigarette. And then the sign is passed on to her neck. Ah, I get it. Next, someone else comes on stage with a drink in hand wearing a sign that says, alcohol. I was going to guess that. (laughs) Yep. And I want to know what the bottle was. Like, we've got to get a bottle of alcohol. My grandpa has one. Okay, get from All right. (laughs) While she initially refuses, she eventually gives in to another temptation and becomes immediately intoxicated and gains another sign of shame. The sins and signs that follow include a fighting couple her parents with the signs that say divorce, a guy who offers her a joint, (laughs) drugs, and the sex sign was always saved for a more handsome older boy who gets to (laughs) dance, and she gets to dance with him and then passes his sex sign on to her. She also has struggles with addiction and depression, as though these aren't actual medical conditions. She's <laughs> finally tempted by suicide, as she just can't stand the shame of all her teenage experimentation. My God. This has all come to a massive crescendo while the song has its instrumental organ break with the thunderclaps <laughs> around 2 minutes 18 seconds if you're actually listening to Spotify. <laughs> where she is depicted running around the stage in a confused, devastated manner while surrounded by the rest of us who had given her our sinful signs. We formed a creepy circle around her that she cannot break free from. At the final dramatic chord shift with the phrase, Turn around, bright eyes. (laughs) Guess who appears? Hey, Jesus. Jesus. You got it. He enters dramatically, breaking through the sinful circle, and holds her as she weeps. 
he moves the signs one by one and places them all on himself. She looks on as he then appears to pray up to heaven while assuming all of her sins. I must add that this felt especially poignant at the time. I agree. As the man who played Jesus in this skit had also portrayed Jesus in all the church's massive choir <laughs> theatrical productions around that time. The so, go-to Jesus. Yep, yep. So to us, he was basically Jesus. <laughs> Jesus eventually takes the signs on himself and rips them up one by one as the music fades away. Jesus and she walk off the stage together. <laughs> I am telling you, this shit killed in youth group around 20,000, oops, mm-hmm. at, at about 2001. Everybody got very emotional over it. I laugh about it regularly with one of my friends and my younger sister who were in youth group at the same time. Hope you enjoy the story and that you'll remember it next time you hear the song. I love that they use like a secular song. I know. To do the whole thing. I personally think that I have seen that sketch, skit, whatever you want to call it, on YouTube. On Broadway. I don't know how I was watching YouTubes of like little uh, youth <laughs> groups doing their shit. But if you think about it, too, it's like the easiest one to put on. Like, OK, do we have poster board? Yes. And markers? Do we have yep. people? We've got a skit. And then you hear this. Do we have permission to use this song? No. But we go ahead. That's right. Here we go. Oh, man. That's, it does. It pulls at you. And then you got to turn around. Man. Well, thank you for ruining my Thank you vibe. for ruining. <laughs> yeah, the song that I will hear on Sirius FM now. Because you right. know what? That's what happens. I manifest stuff like that. Yeah, it is not the computer listening at all. So here we go. We've got one more. Um, my story... The mention of creepy youth pastors in the Cheers to Leaving interview reminded me of two youth pastor adjacent men I knew in my college years. And that is a thing. Youth pastor adjacent. Right. Exactly. Yeah. They're always around. Mm -hmm. They're Mm going to be like the guys who, uh, you know, share a room with people on uh, some kind of a youth group trip. Yeah. You always kind of want to be with that guy. Exactly. Yeah. Always have um. that Bible with them, and the Bible's <laughs> always black. Okay. Um, let's see. First was the worship leader at a campus ministry I attended. He was early 30s, and I was 20 or 21. He became worship pastor after he almost severed his hand in an accident, which was <laughs> God's way of telling him to quit his job and go into ministry. Isn't God great? <laughs> but if they almost severed his hand, when they said praise thing, I'm like, I pictured a guy with a guitar. And then the severed hand part, I'm like, not a guy with a guitar. <laughs> um, uh, so, uh, yeah, I guess maybe that was God's way of going, oh, don't do this job. Well, you better go, you know, right. preach because you're going to need that hand <laughs> in the other job. I don't know. Um, okay. It says he came up to me after a meeting. Quote, C, I just wanted to let you know that I'm so proud of you for working with the youth. I can really see your heart for them. I'm always available if you need advice or want to pray about anything. Unquote. No, no. I had agreed to be a big sister to a tween, not give her my kidney, (laughs) thanks to purity culture leaving me unable to interact with men and my creep meter being pretty sensitive. I'm sure I inadvertently gave off, ew, gross vibes, and he didn't try to chat me up again. He ended up marrying a girl one year younger than me the summer after she graduated. Sounds familiar. God. The second man was a pastor in training at my parents' Southern Baptist Church. He gave long, boring sermons in which the only entertaining moments were when he mentioned Jesus Christ. (laughs) My mom wanted me to marry him, but I remained gloriously single well over a decade later. Love your show. (laughs) (laughs) 
<laughs> oh, my sneak gosh. In one last one. Well, that's it. Like, there are so many, as you and I know, of those ones in training who also uh, married pretty young people. And that is that. Well, you have to get them while they're stupid. Thank you. Sorry. Okay, <laughs> this one is, let's finish this one by Carly. My name's Carly. Hi, Carly. Hi, Carly. And I'm currently 16. Carly, turn this off. <laughs> and just a couple years fresh out of a very strict, fundamental Christian church and school. Congratulations. Because of the low funding for everything, we didn't get to do many things as a youth group. But one summer, we were able to go on a trip to Kentucky, sorry, for a conference <laughs> that lasted about a week and visit a few colleges while we were down there. My best friend and girlfriend at the time was able to go with us this year. A few years prior to this event, we both had admitted to being gay and had been experimenting with each other. During this trip, we were able to share a room together and have a ton of fun while, our, <laughs> while of course, being told by the guest pastors that our whole lives were made of sin. I still remember making out with her in a closet at the Creation Museum in our <laughs> encounter. <laughs> two by two, they came. But on boom. Okay. The year after that trip is when we left the school and church because the school had found out about our relationship. Both her and I weren't allowed back to school unless we, quote, became straight. She denied any of it, and I left the school. I still miss her. Oh, but best decision of my life to leave that environment. That's right, amen. Yeah. She goes, if you want to out the school, it's Twin City Christian Academy. <laughs> <laughs> Said with the defiant <laughs> voice of a 16-year-old. Oh, my God. And to all our LGBTQI listeners, you know we love you. You know we think that you're accepted fully. And we will keep shitting on the legislators who try and say you aren't. But, oh, my God, I'm so glad that you've still come out of that uh, with yourself intact. Yeah. And it's it's so funny to me, too, because I, I think I mentioned on a podcast episode a long time ago, like so many parents probably sent their kids off to the Baptist college where we went thinking this will be great. We'll keep them away from the girls dorm. And they didn't want to have anything to do with the girls dorm. They were happy finding people in their they, own dorm. They were having sleepovers. Yeah. My husband and I took a walk the other day, and we're talking about all the messed up people in our missionary group where, <laughs> where he and I met and, like, where we thought they were today. But seriously, there were about two normal ones, and everyone else had huge weird problems. Of course, you find out all the huge weird problems because that's all you talk about all day long in your little sessions. Yeah. But just continuing to realize that people go there to maybe fix themselves in whatever yeah. way it was. Yeah. There was this one guy. We will call him Jeff because that was his name. And <laughs> he was very antisocial, and he would, like, laugh through all our prayer times because we had to do, like, a specific way that you pray. First, you praise God. The next is you confess your sins and ask for forgiveness. You know, and this is a way to like, I don't even know. And then you pray, whatever. But it's like a to-do list. It is. It is so that's like, good. you know, I know I do like a checklist. Um, <laughs> but he would start laughing just like you during oh, no. some of the prayer. And so, of course, people thought it was like a demonic thing. And they would be like, you need to either stop laughing, leave, or, hey, let's all pray for him and all that. But he was so weird, and he would laugh through so many of the things. And then my husband and I are like, what if, because he also seemed a little homeless, what, what? if he had nowhere to go? 
And that's what he did. Like, what if a parent was like, you know what? You have nowhere to go. Get your shit together. Last chance. We're going to pay to send you to this thing. And that's why he was there. And he was laughing at us the whole time. And it was like our minds (laughs) blew that we didn't figure this out till 30 years later that that could have been it. That people might have had like, what do I do next in life? Or... Yes. I I want to travel or I need to be fixed or someone paid for them or their church paid for them right. to do these things or go to these schools. And he was and just he, laughing at what suckers they were for like accepting him in it. there. Yeah. Like listen to all this dumbass <laughs> right, like, right. checklist to Jesus. <laughs> he was not demon possessed and he might not have even been mentally unstable. He could have just been like, I am just trying to ride this wave. <laughs> and it's funny. I don't know. Oh, my gosh. Send us your funny true stories. We love all of you. As Bonnie said before, these are like our favorite ones to do. This is the, this is the best because this feels like actual community. For sure. Like we're all embarrassed of different things that happened or freaked out and only we can understand yeah so have a great week everyone and um find us on our other new podcasts just look up karen Ali, and all seven of them will show up (laughs) don't be a shit pile okay bye